Shalom, and welcome to Heretics Standing at Sinai, a podcast for those in or adjacent to the Jewish community who are searching for a place to deepen their spirituality without sacrificing their rationality. I'm Rabbi J. Tel Rav, and each week we'll have a conversation about new ways to exist in the world as an intentional presence and of ways of making our lives mean something. Whether you've been exploring spirituality for years or this is your first time considering it, we're glad you're here. Each week we explore a spirituality known as non-duality. This Jewish mystical tradition sees the world as a manifestation of God. The entire universe is not something created by a supernatural God. Rather, the reality that we experience is nothing other than God. Using the text Open Secrets by Rabbi Rami Shapiro, we've been making our way through a playful presentation of this spiritual tradition that can be found in all the major religions, including non-dual Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, and other new religious movements. It's been a few weeks since our last episode, so I'll take a quick moment to refresh your memory. When we left off, Reb Yerachmiel, the fictitious rabbi, told us that the work of being human is to till the hard-packed soil of our soul. What does that mean? It means that we break through the insistence on the illusion of duality and begin to see the world as a oneness. When we get there, we start to call that chaya consciousness, living awareness. And then beyond that, perhaps we make it to Yechida consciousness, which is when we absorb into the oneness of the universe and transcend the distinction. This next letter to his imaginary student, Aaron Herschel, will begin where we left off and explain how that works. This week, we're going to hear Reb Yerachmiel reference a teaching that some of you might recognize. It's the Lurianic Kabbalistic creation myth. Uh, that has to do with the shattering of sacred vessels. I'll share some more thoughts afterwards when we get to that, but for now, let's hear this new letter, which is entitled, Walking Inward. My dearest Aaron Herschel, I left the door open for you to ask me about how we till the soil of Nishama to let in the life that is Chaya and Yechida and your insight regarding the idea of spiritual practice was quite interesting. You understand that God's shlemut, God's unity, means that God is right here and now, in you, with you, as you. Nishama is no less of God than Chaya and Yechida. The difference is that it pretends to be other than God, and that Pretending is so strong that we begin to act as if it were so. In truth, there can be no separation from God. We've spoken of this in the context of Rabbi Luria. He imagined a world where God is other and broken, and our task is to repair God to wholeness. But it's not God who's broken. It's we who are broken. It's not God who is other than us, it is we who insist upon being other than God. Who does all this insisting? The nishama, the self that imagines it is all we are. The result of all spiritual practice is to open the nishama to the greater reality of God in which it resides. This is what I mean when I speak of nishama opening to chaya. This is like a wave realizing it's part of the ocean. It discovers its true nature, its true home, and in doing so, becomes more compassionate, more loving. But how? How are we to open to the greater reality of God in, with, and as all beings? Torah provides us with the answer when it tells of God's call to Avram, Lech Lecha. Lech Lecha literally means walk into yourself. What self? 
not neshama, but chaya. How? Read the rest of the command. Lech lecha, get yourself out of your land, away from your relatives, out of your father's house, to a land that I'll show you. To walk into yourself is to see the land God wishes us to see. Not a literal land of rock and dirt, but a holy land of milk and honey, a spiritual land that nurtures and alivens. How do you get there? By freeing yourself from your culture, your tribe, and your parents. I went to get water from the well last evening and left the bucket of water outside to stay cool. When I went to drink from the bucket this morning, I found a thin layer of ice had formed on the surface of the water. I had to crack the surface ice to drink the water. Now, it's true that both the solid ice and the liquid water are the same. They're both water in different forms. Why did I not drink the ice? Because ice does not meet my need for a glass of water. For that, I need liquid. So I broke through the one to reach the other. It's the same with spiritual practice. All is God. Nishama, the hardened ego, and Chaya, the compassionate soul, are both of God. Nishama is like ice, and Chaya is like water. And only the latter can slake my spiritual thirst. So I have to crack the ice of Nishama and drink the water of Chaya. Spiritual practice is how I crack the ice. Do not think the ice is bad or that the ice is your enemy. I have said that Nishama is a necessary part of you. Without it, you cannot run your business or care for a wife and family. But with Nishama alone, you will do these things without the deepest joy and compassion of which you're capable. For that, you need Chaya. And for Chaya, you need spiritual practice. How does Nishama become hardened? It's trained to be that way by our parents, our relatives, our culture. Each of these carries with it assumptions about life, rules about living, and biases about others that harden the self. I don't know if this can be avoided. I do know it can be overcome. The ice can be cracked, the water can be sipped, and the self can be softened by the greater truth of the soul. The softening of the self is what I call entering the promised land. I worry that you may not truly understand me here. I worry that you imagine I am saying you must violently wrest yourself free from your people and your past. I'm not saying that. God said to Avram, Lech lecha, walk inward. Walking is God's command. Don't f- run, don't flee, don't attack. Just walk. Walk gently and purposefully. Walk consciously and continually. Walk inward, not away. And in so doing, you'll find that place of peace that is the land God wishes each of us to find. Now, I want to talk with you about how to do this walking, but I find myself tiring easily and needing to go to bed earlier than even a few months ago. I trust this will pass, but for now I must rest. I'll send this letter as it is. Think about how you have been hardened and what walking inward toward freedom might mean for you. And then write to me. And if you wish to know how I walk inward, Ask, and I'll share this with you. Bishalom. Oh, my. Once again, Rabbi Shapiro reinterprets a classic text according to perfectly acceptable techniques uh, in ways that I've never heard before and therefore we call a chiddush, a new idea. The well-known command to Abraham, lech lecha, is usually considered to refer to a physical journey in the world, probably because that is exactly what he does in reaction to God's command. He picks himself and his entourage up from his homeland 
and they begin a physical journey over towards a land that he'll be shown, uh, the promised land, which turns out to be Canaan or Israel. But here, Rami turns the idea on its head and talks instead about a psychological journey. When we're told lech lecha, it's not walking yourself to a different place. It's walking to find yourself. And what he says you can find in there is the chaya consciousness, the part that remains protected inside from this difficult and sometimes violent world by our hard shell of ego, of the neshama. This ego, this protective coating, is sometimes called the klipa, uh, or uh, a shell. And here he brings in Isaac Luria's teaching about the creation of the world. Luria lived in the 16th century and spent the last part of his life in Svat, where he was the father of the Kabbalistic tradition. And he created a myth of creation that explains how the world is set up. He described God first pulling back from encompassing everything, leaving a void, a vacancy, and then crafted these uh, crystal vessels into which God delivered divine energy. Very quickly, upon starting the process, the vessels proved inadequate for God's energy and shattered. And what rained down into the physical world were the shards of these vessels. Luria describes our job as human beings is to find these shards and to lift them back up into place to repair the vessels, as it were. This is his understanding around the idea of tikkun. The problem is that these crystal shards, they're not physical, by the way, they're hard to find because they're hidden in this world. They may have been obvious to see at one point, but now they're covered in schmutz. The world, being a harsh, dirty, difficult place, leaves this coating on everything, particularly holy things. They can't survive unaffected in this harsh world. I, for some reason, am thinking about the New York City subway system. My family just went into town uh, oh, a couple weeks back, and we were in Grand Central Station, and my kids were aware that every single surface uh, in the train tunnels and, and the, the connecting hallways is covered by uh, that, that soot, that black dirt uh, that you just don't want to touch. It leaves you feeling like when you come out of that space, all you want is to wash your hands. It feels uh, like the subway is the epitome of the human impact on the physical world. The, the crafting of this marvel of technology is aggressive and it's ambitious and it's symbolic of the egoistic nature of humanity. What would be the opposite of those elements? Maybe we'd say it would be a newborn infant or um, a perfect untrampled flower or maybe um, a rainbow. These are things that have, have not yet been affected by being in this world and our, uh, our nishama-driven desire to impact them. Human vulnerability is another way of describing this. Uh, we have inside us, according to Luria, these shards of holiness, but they're trapped in us because uh, the klipa, which keeps out um, everything aggressive and, and uh, scary, it also traps inside the beautiful and the holy. So when we're in a relationship, for example, and we contemplate the idea of opening ourselves, our most precious self, to crack the ice of that klipa, to get to the water beneath, allowing another in or allowing an experience to really touch us, of course it's scary. What if the other hurts us, uh, wounds us? Uh, so in instead, we close up to what is possible and we're left lonely, uh, isolated, and certainly disconnected from the oneness of the universe. That is the pleasure of the ego. 
So what Rami Shapiro is, is encouraging us to think about here is to look at the journey that we read about that is prescribed for Abraham, to read that as a spiritual journey inward into ourselves first, realizing that it's just the ego that makes us think that there's no connection between us and everything else around us. It's the ego that makes it feel like a dualistic world. The ego has a vested interest in tricking us. Our ego wants to feel as though it's us against the world. And sometimes it is, but that's only one reality. It's also true that we're embedded in the world as sacred presences. And when we embrace that, what remains is a gentle ability to be in the world without having to experience it the way a warrior experiences battle. Last week at Shabbat services here at Temple Sinai, I spoke about the progress made by the daughters of Tzalofachad in the book of Numbers and how it felt so encouraging to see women's rights uh, and gender equality begin its journey in a text that old. And then in that past week's portion, uh, significant elements of those rights were, uh, were pulled back and how difficult it was for us to watch women's rights, uh, which had been granted, to have them then taken away again. Using that idea of making progress and then being pushed backward, I talked about how important it is in this world, looking all around ourselves, seeing examples everywhere of progressive movement being yanked backward to conserve uh, older forms of, of society that felt good for some and less good for others, how hard that is emotionally to take. And what I discussed was that our ancestors, having left the narrow place, the Mitzrayim of Egypt, and going out into the world, uh, into the unknown, wandering through a wilderness towards a promised land, that the fear often was expressed in a desire to go back to the, the difficulties of Egypt, knowing that they were bad, they were at least better than the unknown, or at least it felt that way. Before the Michamocha, it was time for us to acknowledge that we exist really at all times in that wilderness. But what did our ancestors do? They kept going. They walked forward. They took a journey into the unknown because they knew that there was a promised land uh, ahead of them. So what Rami is telling us here in this chapter is that when we hear the divine command, Lech Lecha, and if you've been feeling like the world is a dangerous place and you feel disconnected from what's going on, then Lech Lecha can be heard as a command to you directly, to your sense of self, even if it is an illusion. And that command turns you inward and tells you to march right through the wilderness of your ego to find internally the soul that is Chaya consciousness, that sees the beauty of what is and worries for moments a little bit less about the, the hard, angry realities out there. We don't stay there, but we visit. And after we've spent some time in this beautiful consciousness, will return to the world as dualistic selves. Our nishama will regain control. Our ego will take back over. But we will be softened. We will be less aggressive. We'll see fewer enemies everywhere we look. We will be more gentle with the physical world, seeing it, too, as a manifestation of God, just like ourselves. And how is this accomplished? He's prescribing contemplative practice, meditation, really. In next week's episode, I'll speak with Mike Markovitz, and then we'll hear a little bit more about Reb Yerachmiel's prescription for how to take oneself inward, how to break through the, the klipa, the ego, the hard ice of our uh, external protective armor, and to really get at the, the beautiful divine inner self that yearns for some attention. Personally, 
I've wrestled with the discipline required for true contemplative practice my whole life. I've always been told that the results of a good practice are transformational, and I aspire to that. I look for ways to make it a part of my life because I do believe that if I spend more time inside, walking inward, lach lecha, then I will like myself on the outside a whole lot more. Perhaps there's a way we can do that together. I know that the Shabbat morning Avodat HaLev service is a meaningful expression of that for many people. And if you're local to Temple Sinai in Stamford, perhaps you'll join us for that the first Saturday morning of each month. I also want to say a few words now about what's coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, as we head towards Rosh Hashanah, which begins this year on September 15th, I'm going to dedicate the final couple of weeks leading up to that for a series of conversations about how a person who resonates with the teachings of Rami Shapiro, who sees the, the efficacy and the truth in non-duality, how does that individual get the most out of a high holiday moment? How do you take liturgy, which is explicitly dualistic, and find your truth in them, the truth of non-duality, of a God who encompasses all and who is not standing over us as we pass beneath, judging us and deciding who shall live and who shall die. So I hope that you'll join me in those coming weeks as we look at some other material that can help us make the most of those high, holy moments together with our community members and using our traditional materials. I'm so glad that you've decided to spend this time with us today, and I hope you'll come back. If you would like to read a little bit more about what I've discussed, you can click below for a transcript of today's podcast. If you enjoyed this and want to be notified of future episodes, feel free to click on the subscribe button and share the idea with someone else you know will enjoy exploring these ideas along with you. And until next time, all you heretics out there, stand proud. <laughs>